Hello, and welcome to Nano. My name's John, and I'm joined by two colleagues, Mike and Carla. Hi, everyone. We're going to be looking at cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDKs, today, and kind of how they affect a number of systems, and how targeting them has been kind of a struggle for a while. But it seems like we're able to target them selectively now. Let's take a look at the pathways first. So here you can see that CDKs, sort of in the middle here, are involved with a number of different pathways here. But the major focus right now, looking at CDK1 and 2, is seeing how it affects cell cycle as a checkpoint proteins at the G1S, DNA replication, SG2, and G2M checkpoints. You can see that CDK2 helps drive some of the early checkpoints, and CDK1 does more at the later stages. Their impact on DNA damage repair into apoptosis, as well as cell proliferation, makes CDKs excellent targets within cancer systems. That's pretty cool, John. Um, are they mostly for what types of cancer indications? So they've been used in a number, but currently the ones that that we use CDK treatment for most frequently are breast and lung. Um, they're really, really good in combination of where slowing down the cell cycle and cell proliferation doesn't seem to be able to do enough to get rid of you know, shrinking tumors uh, on their own typically. So often it's paired with either you know, a hormone inhibitor or maybe some DNA damage. And as you can see, the DNA damage can really trigger a lot of interesting stress in the system. And reducing the amount of hormones up here can reduce the proliferation impact here. So there's a lot of ways to complement CDK inhibitors through a number of avenues. So these are mostly nuclear enzymes? Uh, for the most part. Uh, for the ones that I've selected, I've focused on the checkpoint aspects of CDKs. But these are only a small subset. And we might be interested in looking at other ones that you might have heard of, such as CDK7, 9, 11, and 14, which have interestingly similar uh, modes of action, but very different parts of different pathways. So it can provide a very interesting set of you know, targets that while they have similar regulation and complex formation through cyclins, um, overall we do see some pretty big differences and how they can affect the system. Yeah. But as you can probably guess, it's really important to make these highly selective. Hitting multiple of these at the same time, while they might slow down multiple parts of the cell cycle, there are often numerous feedback uh, loops that can help push this forward if we don't target one at a time. And so it's really, really interesting to be able to see how different uh, selectivities are able to greatly enhance their overall therapeutic value. And so we're really going to be trying to look at how selectivity has been achieved in CDK1 and 2, as well as 4-6. Yeah, I saw that knocking out CDK4 and 6 can uh, interfere with blood vessel generation. Yeah, CDK4-6 is really more involved in a lot of other transcription uh, sort of situations and gene expression groupings than the other ones, which, while well, they're, they're definitely involved, uh, CDK4-6 seems to have a more direct involvement with MAPK, as well as a number of other pathways slightly above it, which can include, uh, you know, vascular tissue formation. So it's, uh, it's an interesting space, and... Um, yeah, let's take a look at a few structures, though, and see how great. this went about being targeted. Yeah, so I'm going to start off with a nonspecific uh, example. We'll, we'll first look at Dynacyclib, um, and this is in CDK1, and kind of just getting a, a few beats on um, kinase inhibition uh, by these inhibitors. And so, Carla, I know you're you're very familiar with uh, kinases and how uh, inhibitors <laughs> often interact. So if you want to just walk us through this basic example to kind of get us started, uh, we can then differentiate how this looks different in other uh, contexts. So it looks like, you know, it has uh, two donors right here interacting with the hinge region of this kinase. And yeah, I'm going to guess... Yeah, 83, yeah. Ah, all right. 
Mm. Yeah. Seems like uh, the ring system here is also have some pretty favorable interactions with the hydrophobic sort of top and bottom of the pocket here as well. Looks like the phenylalanine gatekeeper is in the back there. And mm. then the catalytic lysine yeah. also towards the back. Mm. The ATP binding site. Yeah. This is definitely a, a type 1 interaction within the pocket, uh, the active state of the kinase. Uh, yeah. And so a lot of the early CDK inhibitors, as you said, are PAN inhibitors, and so they suffer from toxicities, right? So there's a, a reason mm -hmm. why one might want to have a more selective CDK inhibitor, say a CDK2 inhibitor. Um, as we saw with these pathways earlier, um, they do affect a large number of checkpoints as well as systems, and in healthy cells, this can make it pretty nonspecific. And that can lead to all sorts of side effects since more than just tumor cells, you know, proliferate. So definitely have to be careful. Um, one thing that uh, after kind of seeing this sort of general inhibitor, I, I thought uh, we'd take a look at it overlaid uh, into CDK2 as well. Um, and so in orange, if you remember, is still CDK1. And here we've done a superposition um, of CDK1 uh, and 2. We can see in the greens, uh, we have the CDK2 interactions. But overall, this is the same inhibitor, but two uh, different proteins. Um, yeah. It's an awful Anything, lot of homology uh, between the two. <laughs> oh, yeah. Lots of homology. Yeah, and if you look here at the the binding to the hinge region, and if you look at where mm. the, the phenylalanine and the lysine are and where the ligand is res with respect to those, it's almost identical. Oh, yeah. There's only a few places that I think are noticeably different as far as what residues are even in the active site. And the big one is over here looking at this histidine and the serine uh, that we're seeing right here. But, but other than that, it they do look eerily uh, similar, which is part of the reason why it's been somewhat difficult to make specific inhibitors uh, targeting these two different kinases. The hydrogen bonds that we're seeing here, um, we can easily kind of distinguish them by measuring the distance from the nitrogen here to the corresponding uh, oxygen. And if we also remember there's a hydrogen coming off of here, so it's not really even 2.65 angstroms, it's probably it's closer close. to, you know, yeah, just about two, maybe 2.2. 2. Right. And that's that's, that's well within, yeah, a good hydrogen bond. And I think we'll probably see a similar, yeah, yeah pretty much the similar. same distance on the other one. Um, then yeah. Get it here. Yeah, it's probably, I mean, this probably won't, we probably want a, a carbonyl still, but and here's we'll, we'll this, take what uh, we can get. <laughs> oh, it's an NH here with an N here. Yeah, we can probably still get some kind of interaction, but maybe uh, yeah, if there's here, enough resonance in this system, I don't know. <laughs> here's here's the other one. Here's the other one. The NH on this amide with this nitrogen here. It's the corresponding one. So these mm, these oh, are okay. the other two. Yeah. 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 Oh, those look. I mean, these are a little bit further, but not. Still, if we subtract one off of that or just 0.8, it's still more than close enough for a good hydrogen bond. So, yeah, I think uh, this is definitely kind of convincing is, of how, uh, yeah. Yeah, they're almost identical in length. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Let's take a look at uh, some selective inhibitors in the similar space. So I'm going to first look at the CDK1 selective inhibitor um, that I was kind of interested in. And this is a, a molecule that was made by AstraZeneca. And what we can kind of see differentiating this from the other CDK1. So the first thing to note is I, I've marked the uh, specific inhibitor here in red as well as this kind of pinkish color here for the ligand to help distinguish the two. 
And we can still see, obviously, this is a, a, the same protein. And so these line up really, really well. And so really what we're looking at are the differences in how uh, these ligands were designed. And um, while we take a, a, take a look at these ligands on their own. So if I just kind of turn it here, just to kind of give us a little bit better of a profile, um, we can kind of start taking a look at some of these differences here as far as how these were designed. And while it does still have the interactions, these nitrogens nearby that would be needed for a good hinge interaction, uh, where we start seeing a pretty big difference is, you know, down here off of this benzene ring. Um, as well as coming out into here, instead of going, uh, this goes further into the pocket, closer to the DFG motif rather than uh, staying a little bit closer to that hydrophobic patch there. And so these are kind of the two major areas that have changed uh, uh, for these two compounds. And I'm going to turn it back so our proteins are the right orientation when I reveal them again. And we can kind of see what the impact of that is by the interactions with the lysine over there and as well as having a number of additional interactions back into here, pushing the phenylalanine out further, as well as interacting directly with the uh, aspartic acid from the DFG motif. Well, it mm -hmm. looks like the lysine swung way out too, the red one. Yeah. Oh, yeah that's true. There must have been almost yeah. like a repulsive interaction. I find this interesting the here. It looks like a cell phone. Is that what? And then. Yeah, yeah it's a, a cell phone. And it can, uh, well, I, I think that the, uh, let's actually hide the, uh, the non-specific one for a second, just to get a better look at this one alone. Um, but yeah, the sulfone is clearly, uh, probably going to be able to have some amount of interaction with this lysine out here that we're seeing. And, um, this is clearly, uh, something that was not taken advantage of by Dynasty Club. But I do think we've kind of hit the nail on the head of this lysine often can interact with the aspartic acid down here, and that's been disrupted, as well as additional different interactions out towards the periphery of the pocket, kind of making sure we don't just take advantage of the hinge and this hydrophobic patch, which is really common, but finding some spatial differences between these two proteins, it's since there aren't very many residue differences to leverage which is kind of an interesting way. I mean, I normally you just try to find the, the different residue, right, and target it, but they managed to find a, a different way to go about doing it. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's reveal CDK2 uh, uh, with Dynasiclib aligned to the same one in the same space here and seeing how it's not really able to take advantage of the same sorts of interactions when this phenylalanine back here as well as the lysine yeah. Are, are really tightly it. packed it in, in you know packed in there the dynasiclib can really take advantage of that but the uh this azd compound really can't i mean this is almost solvent exposed now yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it doesn't uh reorienting it yeah definitely doesn't favor uh this here but the the rings line up a lot better in this situation interestingly I think what's interesting is in CDK1 and CDK2, these these residues back here are the same, the phenylalanine and the lysine and the valine here, but in CDK2, apparently they don't want to, or they can't shift out in the same way as they can in CDK1 to make room for this ligand to be back here. Mm. And, and so when we dock it, it, it comes more forward. As, as Carla was saying in your docking, this is sticking out to solvent practically. Um, yeah. But but these residues are the same. It's just they're you know they they apparently won't shift out. I know they wouldn't in your docking anyway. But yeah. if they were going to <laughs> yeah. if they were going to accommodate the ligand, that's what they would probably have to do, right? Mm, exactly. Let's take a look at a specific one, uh, one that's been recently approved, uh, a bemisiclib. Looking at it in here, we see the uh, the molecule has a a pretty different strategy overall, even compared to the other the CDK1 and 2, uh, which is to more or less take a lot more advantage of interactions deep into the pocket uh, with this fluorine included as well, 
And we see these two fluorines going back into here. And even though we do maintain uh, some hinge interactions, as we can see with these two carbonyls here, um, there's just a lot more going on back into here, which is reminiscent to a lot of specific EGFR inhibitors um, that were able to have some of these deep pocket interactions to really stabilize it. Um, but we can also see the aspartic acid of the DFG uh, motif is likely somewhat engaged uh, to this region over here too. So I, I hope that uh, you've enjoyed kind of exploring the separation between selective and non-selective CDK inhibitors and noticing how sort of fine the line is between selective and non-selective and these very uh, homologous proteins is really fascinating. And trying to understand how we can better do this uh, can help us lead to much better targets in the future as well as uh, combinatorial therapeutics. Um, yeah, it was great seeing this in VR too. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks for joining us, Mike. And, Exciting. Uh, Thank you. Thank yeah. you, John.